Father God, thank you that you are majestic. Thank you, Lord, that the elders bow before you at your throne. Lord, as your scriptures read and your word proclaimed this morning, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. Speak loudly, Lord, so that we would hear you speak softly, so that we would listen. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'd like to welcome everybody who is watching this recorded sermon this morning, and I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, to the sermon and this morning um, I'm speaking about our minds and you realize that when I did the the call to worship from Psalm 26 um, our thinking determines our outcome and this morning I'd like to speak to you about our minds our thinking and our thoughts at the end of the day our minds drive everything that we do. Every step we take towards godliness and living a more godly life is driven here. Every sin we commit, every lie we tell, every untruth, every time we misrepresent the truth, it begins with a thought. We do not do things mindlessly. Everything begins somewhere in our lives. Um, lawyers use the term premeditated. It means I've thought about it before the time, pre, before, meditate, to think upon. And it's something I've thought about, something that I have considered. Godliness is always premeditated. When I behave in a way that God would have me, have me behave, I'm thinking about it. Sin is always premeditated. When we rebel against God, it begins with a thought. There are very few, few things in this life that are involuntary. The only truly involuntary things are the things that I have no control over, like my heartbeat, my breathing. Yeah, you can say, yeah, I can hold my breath. You can, for a while. But medically, they tell me I breathe between 12 and 20 times per minute. And if I don't do that, we, we all know our little oxypulse meters that we put on our fingers, eh? How many of you have got one? How many of you have got two? <laughs> um, I can't control them. I cannot control the endocrine function in my body. In fact, I have no control over it. Thank goodness. Imagine reminding myself every time to make my heart beat. Hey? Um, but everything else in life is actually a choice of our thinking. And then when we make that choice, we've then got to make the choice whether I'm going to follow that way of thinking or not. I can choose to do things in a specific way and then I can find myself in a horrible mess or I can choose to do things differently. I can choose to lead a life of anger, of criticism, of laziness, of apathy, of pornography, of sexual activity. They all begin with a thought. I can choose to be prejudiced or racist or hateful. But the counter is also true. I can choose to live a life of service, of humility, of purity of heart and eyes. Very often what I see I do. 
I can choose to live a life of forgiveness, of building bridges, of repenting of prejudices. The power of our thinking is so dynamic. It is so powerful and so compelling. We often hear people say, I really don't know what made me do that. Stop and think for a moment. Or they say things like, I don't know what drove me to do this. Or drove me to do that. Stop and think for a moment. Behind every action is a thought. So often I hear God telling me to do things. And I find myself thinking about it. I'm an intelligent human being. Not a mushroom. I don't do things thoughtlessly. If God tells me to do things, then, then I've got to work out the way about how I'm going to do that. Am I going to get in my car and I'm going to drive there or am I going to walk there? A thought has to happen. Every step towards being a more godly person is driven by a thought. Equally, every step towards doing wrong or evil to others is driven by a thought. And to read you a story, I think I put it in the pastoral letter some weeks ago. Story goes, my son Gilbert was eight years old and had been a Cub Scout for only a short time. During one of his meetings, he was handed a sheet of paper, a block of wood, and four tires, and was told to return home and give it all to Dad. That was not an easy task for Gilbert to do. Dad was not receptive at doing things with his son. But Gilbert tried. Dad read the newspaper and scoffed at the idea of making a pine wood derby car with his young, eager son. The block of wood remained untouched as the weeks passed. Finally, Mom stepped in to see if she could figure this all out and the project began. Having no carpentry skills, I decided it would be best if I simply read the instructions and let Gilbert do the work. And he did. I read aloud the measurements, the rules of what we could do and what we couldn't do. Within days, his block of wood was turning into a pine wood derby car. A little lopsided, but looking great, um, at least through the eyes of his mom. Gilbert had not seen any of the other kids' cars and was feeling pretty proud of his blue lightning. The pride that comes with knowing you did something on your own. Then the big night came. With his blue pine wood derby car, car in his hand and pride in his heart, we headed for the big race. Once there was a little pride, once my little one's pride, sorry, once there my little one's pride turned to humility. Gilbert's car was obviously the only car made entirely on his own. All the other cars were father-son partnerships, or rather father jobs, with cool paint jobs and sleek body styles made for speed. A few of the boys giggled as they looked at Gilbert's lopsided, wobbly, unattractive vehicle. To add to the humility, Gilbert was the only boy without a man at his side. A couple of boys who were from single parent homes at least had an uncle or a grandfather by their side. Gilbert had mom. As the race began, it was done in an elimination fashion. You kept racing as long as you were the winner. One by one, the cars raced down the finely sanded ramp. Finally, it was between Gilbert and the sleekest, fastest looking car there. As the last race was about to begin, my wide eye, shy eight-year-old asked if they could stop the race for a minute because he wanted to pray. The race stopped. Gilbert went to his knees, clutching his funny-looking block of wood between his hands. With a wrinkled brow, he set to converse with his father, his heavenly father. He prayed in earnest for a very long minute and a half. Then he stood 
smile on his face and announced, okay, I'm ready to go. As the crowd cheered, a boy named Tommy stood with his father as their car sped down the ramp. Gilbert stood with his heavenly father within his heart and watched his block of wood wobble down the ramp with surprisingly great speed and rushed over the finish line a fraction of a second before Tommy's car. Gilbert leapt into the air with a loud thank you as the crowd roared in approval. The scoutmaster came up to Gilbert with a microphone in hand and asked the obvious question. <coughs> so you prayed to win, hey Gilbert? To which my youngest son answered, Oh no, sir. That wouldn't be fair to ask God to help me beat someone else. I asked him just to help me make it if I didn't make it so that I wouldn't cry when I lost. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinks, so he is. We are a product of what we think. Those quiet times when my mind just wonders, this all results in something being done. I spent some time with my family in Bloemfontein this week. My daughter-in-law said to me, boredom leads to creativity. <coughs> this was such a powerful thought. They knew that I was working because I was sitting at my computer most of the time. Instead of wasting time being bored, the thoughts come to do something creative and something new. But we need to align these thoughts with those of God. My decisions are all a product of my thought. And thinking determines my outcome. Our thoughts, our minds, our brains um, determine the outcome of our lives. We need to think differently. My mom lived with us until she passed away in 2009. And towards the end, she really wasn't well. And I'd get home from work and I'd say, hey, Ma, how are you feeling? And she'd say, my girl, tomorrow will be a good day. What a different way to say I'm not feeling well. But that is how she thought. Always living for tomorrow. You see, our minds are so powerful. Paul picks this up in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and from verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We are carnal creatures. We are driven by three things. The three most powerful things in the world. Power, sex, and money. The people of Corinth were driven exactly by those three things. They loved the sensual. It was a harbor city, and the temple prostitutes were all over everywhere. And Paul writes to them and says, though we walk in the flesh, we cannot be driven by this flesh. We cannot live according to that way of thinking. There are four things that we need to know about our thinking. Our battles are prime primarily physical. 
But I want to say to you today, our battles are not primarily physical. Our battle is not with a computer screen or the prescription bottle of tablets or the other stuff. Our battle is not against food or a lonely room. Our battle is against something we cannot see. Paul says our battle is spiritual. And that is where we have to start. We are material people living in a spiritual world. We have mental battles that seem like physical battles. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have such a battle raging in my mind that it, almost, it makes me tired. It's almost like when I'm playing rugby uh, against the All Blacks yesterday. Boy, my legs were sore. <laughs> hey? I don't think I've ever pushed so hard in a scrum. Um, but it's when we, we fight these, these battles in our mind that they seem to make us pretty tired. Our battles are financial. You know that little plastic card? I'm a win. We over worry, we overspend, we overstretch, we overestimate the joy that money can bring. Money cannot bring you joy. God does. They seem like physical battles, but in real terms, they are rather mental battles. The fourth problem that we have, the third problem that we have is relational problems. We engage in relationships with other people and they say one thing and we pull away. Or we become deceitful or angry or jealous. And all of these emotions flow from thinking. From arrogant to apathetic, they flow from the thoughts in our minds. And then we have a moral dilemma. Do I honor God or do I honor myself? I know what is right and I know what is wrong. But what am I going to choose? And don't tell me it just happens. My weapons for battle are spiritual because I'm in a spiritual battle. We cannot bring physical weapons to a spiritual war. God has given us the weapons that we have to fight with. The problem is that I bring with me my own weapons which are anger and jealousy and division and impurity and drunkenness. And I bring these weapons into a spiritual battle. We fight with these weapons and then we ask why we lose. <coughs> All that happens when we fight with these weapons is that we become impure. If I use flesh weapons in a spiritual battle, I'm going to lose every time. My weapon that God gives me is the word of God. This is the weapon that has divine power. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. But rather, it is something that will tear down the strongholds of the evil one. Time in the world, word is battle. Because it renews my mind. It washes God's word over me. It washes my mind. And I'm, be able, and I'm able to think more clearly. If you're not in God's word, you'll never change. You cannot change yourself. There's only one person who could change you, and that's God. If you're not in God's word, you will never change, and you're going to find yourself in the same cycle that you're in, in now, 10 years from now. If you want a different outcome, you need to do things differently. Last week, in our prayer time, our son in New Zealand led the devotions and, and he called it resetting your button. Remember that, Mias? It was amazing. He said, 
The sign of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different, rela a different outcome. That's a sign of insanity. And that speaks to me about each and every one of us. We keep on doing the same things, but we want a different outcome. To destroy deep-rooted thinking is difficult. And the only way I can do that is to allow the word to become the deep-rooted growth in my life, in my mind. It's difficult because it means I need to know the word. I need this godly explosive power, this theos dynatos, this God-given power. I need this to take down the strongholds in my mind. Our thought processes are generally that I'm nothing, that I'm useless, that I can't do stuff. And these are just strongholds where in God, in the word God says to me, I can do all things. Not some things. I can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. You see, I need to take that word and make it my own. I need to turn that word into Theos Dinatos. I need to turn those words into the power of God in my life. God wants me to destroy the strongholds that hold me down. And the only way I can do that is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 where he says I need to take every thought captive to the word of God. I need to arrest these thoughts that come to derail me. To arrest something means to tie it up and to cart it away, right? Don't know how many of you have ever been arrested, but that is what it means. They either tie your hands in front of you or behind your back and whisk you off. And that's what I need to do to these thoughts that try to derail me. I need to arrest them. I need to take them captive to the word of God. But you know what? I'm so wise in my own thinking that I never ever do that. I even have an acronym for that. It's called IMO. Anybody know what that stands for? I didn't make it up. It stands for, in my opinion, thank you, Barbara, in my opinion. But what's God's opinion? What's Christ's opinion? We're arrogant, we're crafty, and we're sly. We all think we're better than others. We think that we are awesome. There comes a time when I need to to diminish those thoughts. It's not my opinion. Anything that has been raised against the knowledge of God, anything that is counter God is godless. And if I'm going to change my mind, then I need to put God first. And the only way I can do that is to get into the word and to make sure that I know the word Jesus did that. When the devil came to tempt him um, in those 40 days, every time the devil told him to do something, he said, it is written. Three times. Can we say that? It is written. The only way we can say that is when we get into the word. Okay, so I've given you a lot of theory. Now let's come down to the practical. How do I do this? Most of you have got a computer, I'm sure. All got computers. If I want to restart my computer, reset what I'm doing, I push three buttons. <laughs> Don't I, Heath? <laughs> Control, Alt, 
delete. <laughs> and my computer magically switches off. And then all of a sudden it starts up again. Sometimes we need to stop playing games. Sometimes we need to push control alt delete. I need to take control of the things I see, I hear, and I do. Nobody else can take control of that. You are the only person who can control what you see, what you hear, what you do. If somebody else can force you to do stuff, or force you to look at stuff, or force you to hear stuff, my friends, you need to take a step back. Stop playing games in your head. We innocently go onto, onto sites on our computers knowing what's behind them. We know that it's not good for us, but what do we do? We do it. When somebody starts telling a joke, you can actually hear where it's going, but what do I do? I stand and listen. Because if I turn and walk away, they might call me names. They will. But they don't define me. God defines me. Alt is short for alternative, am I right? Thank you, Heath. I need to start thinking about other things. I find this in Philippians 4 verse 8, where Paul writes and says, In conclusion, my friends, fill your minds with those things that are good, that deserve praise, that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Philippians 4 8, 4 9. Put into practice what you have learned and received from me, Paul, both from my words and from my actions. And the God who gives us peace will be with you. It's not an airy fairy thing up here. This is steak on the plate. If I fill my mind with anger, I'm going to become angry. If I fill my mind with jealous thoughts, I'm going to become jealous. If I fill my mind with deceitful things, I'm going to become deceitful. Don't kid yourself. Push the alternative button. And then delete. By changing our actions, uh, changing our way of thinking, we are able to delete those things that push us in the wrong direction. We need to delete the things that the devil tells me to do. A friend of mine is, is a judge. A very really good friend of mine. And she tells me how many times she hears somebody say, I don't know what made me do it. The devil pushed me to do it. No. Push your shoulders back. Stand up and stand firm. By changing the way we think, um, we're able to delete those things that push us in the wrong direction. We're able to delete the devil, the things the devil tells us to do. And it's okay to tell him to go to hell because that's where he belongs. He doesn't belong in charge of your life. Paul tells us to arrest these thoughts and take them captive to Jesus. My mentor who lives in the States uh, would often say to me, we'd, we're often in conversation, we'll be talking, and she'll say, oh, I need to take that captive to Jesus. I need to take that and arrest it. And say, Jesus, please cover my way of thinking. Please clear my heart. I'll never change or live differently unless I change the way I think. The key to all of this is to take arguments, opinions, and godless thoughts to Jesus. 
to push, control, alt, delete. Take all the self-justifying behavior and the lofty opinions um, captive to Jesus. We need to do that every day. We will never live differently without the power of Jesus in our lives. Friends, I'm laying it on thick today. But it is so true if we want to, if we want to be different, if we want to live differently, then we've got to start thinking the way God wants us to think. contagious so on Wednesday I was sitting I use Wednesdays to write my sermons I was sitting working on my sermon and Emma and Becca had been playing around and uh, all of a sudden the house became a bit quiet because they're homeschooled but they were on break this week so um, they were playing outside and then they came inside and the house became very quiet and I thought oh well they must be doing something creative and uh, the next minute, Emma came and sat at the desk with me, at the table with me. She's eight, with her Bible, and started reading from Genesis. And then she said to me, Granny, what are you reading? I said, well, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, girl. And there this little eight-year-old sat reading with me. She didn't understand it. So she got the sermon first. Eh? Sorry, you're getting it second. Because we can take our thoughts captive. We can be the example that other people need to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just bring every thought today captive to your word. Father, help me in this week to arrest thoughts that go in a way that I don't need to go. Father, I ask that you be my first thought and my last thought, my Aleph and my Tav. In Jesus' name. Amen.